the binding constraints and what are the non-binding constraints. And I was saying that binding constraints are normally those equations which would be at the point of intersection as you read through your solution which you say this is the optimal or this is the point that gives you the maximum value like in our case because we are aiming at uh, maximizing uh, the profit. Any uh, equation or any inequality that doesn't contribute to the point, like in our case here, we had the equation y is equals to 15, which was coming from the constraint uh, that was the material uh, M2, uh, 2y less than or equivalent to uh, 30. You realize that that particular constraint is not exhausted. Uh, we call it an unbinding uh, constraint. Now, when we know that uh, an equality is contributing to what we are calling a binding constraint, definitely when we substitute the values of our uh, decision variables, in this case x is equals to 9 and y is equals to 11, if we go by substituting this in the inequalities which are calling the binding constraints, you realize that you'll have zero amount left, you'll have used everything. And so, such a resource which you have used everything, if you are now, uh, like you want to add more units of X or even Y, because such a resource was exhausted, you require to purchase extra units. That's why we normally say, a resource that has already been exhausted, for you to do an additional amount of such a resource, then you have to buy them. And so a unit of any uh, extra amount that you require, you'll have to buy so there's a price attached to this. This is the one we call a shadow price. And I repeat, definition of a shadow price is the amount per unit of a resource that has already been exhausted in the production of some units at a particular optimal point. Such a way when you wish to add more units in your production, then it would mean you have to uh, say buy such extra units. And therefore, you have to part with some amount. This unit price is the one we call a shadow price. Any non-binding constraint, that is, a constraint which is not exhausted, a resource that has a balance, you don't need to uh, say uh, buy an extra unit of that. Reason, you still have some other uh, resources which are available, let's say, in the store. And so you not be uh, parting with any amount as you buy this particular resource you can just get them from, for example, uh, your stock. And therefore, shadow price of a non-binding constraint will never ever be there. Its value is equivalent to zero. But for a binding constraint, it will never have a shadow price of zero. The value will always be existing. And remember, price has to be a positive value. So that is a very important aspect that comes out when you have already solved your problem, let's say using the graphical method. When you use the corner point method as a way of evaluating within your feasible region which point contributes to the maximum value of your profit, say, then the binding constraints, remember, are the ones that gives that particular optimal point. Non-binding constraint is any other equation that you may see after you have represented it on the graph, representing a resource that has not been exhausted, and therefore its, its, its uh, shadow price will always be equivalent to zero. Now, what do we call an unused resource? An unused resource is usually called a slack. I repeat, any amount of a resource that was acting as a constraint that has not been used to the full amount, 
Yeah, there's a balance. That balance of such a resource is the one we call a slack. Now, a binding constraint will not have a slack value. Its value will always be equivalent to zero. I repeat, a binding constraint is a constraint which is fully exhausted at the optimal point, it will always have a slack value of zero. A non-binding constraint, whichever we are saying there's a balance, it has not been exhausted at the optimal point, then the slack value will always exist and it can never ever be equivalent to, uh, to zero. So when we are evaluating for the optimal point, we consider which are the resources which have been exhausted and which are the resources which have got a balance. If a resource has a balance, we call it a slack. If the resource doesn't have a balance, we call it a binding constraint and that it has already been exhausted. And so if we have exhausted it, to acquire any additional uh, unit of such a resource, we have to consider buying an extra unit and therefore we have to consider the shadow, the shadow uh, price. Part two of this question is where I've looked at the method known as the simplex method. And the simplex method is a whole procedure that I want us to discuss maybe in another day where I'll show you how to go through those particular uh, steps. I've picked the same example from the question we were supposed to look at the simplex method, but I felt it is a good example enough for us to be able to still look at the graphical method in that we had only uh, two variables uh, provided. Now, what I'll do, I'll take you through another example which I'd also sent to you uh, earlier long still on the linear programming. But now this example will be looking at, it will still be looking at uh, what we call the graphical method. So this is the same example. So if you have to look at your, your PDF that I had uh, done for you, there was this example which had proposed on the linear programming and under the topic graphical method, the December 2014 question number two, uh, part number C, it is an example where we can uh, draw uh, the graphical representation of the problem comfortably, given that we again have only two, uh, two variables. Uh, let me locate that particular uh, problem. So I suppose you can see from my screen what we are sharing here, the December 2014 question number two, part number C, it's a graphical representation. And uh, again, we have to go through the same process of identifying what is our problem and again, what to be contributing to uh, the decision uh, variables. So this is the December 2014, question number two, part number C. A company manufactures two products, that is P and Q, which have contributions of shillings 124 and shillings 80 per unit respectively. And the product passes through two departments. You can see the availability in terms of time in those two departments, which to us is posing what we can call the uh, constraints or the, uh, the scarce resources. And now before we draw the graphical representation, how do we uh, identify our 
two decision variables. I've said, let the number of units of product P be just P, I've not changed them. And then those of the Q to be just Q units. But you can always have your own way, like you can use X and Y if you feel that is actually comfortable. But as we say so many times, this word let is very, very important to us to be able to start off the problem and again to give the guidance to the person who is to follow up our work. So the problem is on maximization of what? We are asked to determine the optimal production level of the company given the existing capacities, that is the constraint set by the department A and department B time, which is uh, actually the available resource, but now as a scarce resource. So the contributions given are the key elements now for us to pick as our objective function will be defined upon that. And I've said, let the, uh, the objective being on maximization of that contribution be denoted by Z. So I've started the question and say, the solution now, maximum of Z equivalent to 124, P plus 80Q. Remember we had said P to be the number of units of P, the Q to be the number of units of product Q. And then subject to constraints. My constraints are which ones? One is the availability of the department A time, and again, the availability of department B time, which we cannot go beyond whatever is available. And in this case, we have the amounts given us. Uh, we have the amount given us uh, uh, how many hours? In department A, we have 225 hours, and department B, we have 200 hours. Now, if you are to look at the time given in table one, that is the department A and B requirements by product P and Q in each of those two departments, time is given in minutes. So what I've done is I've developed my equations or my inquiries using same, uh, same uh, uh, units of the time. And in this case, I've picked to go by the minutes. So how do we convert 225 hours to minutes and the same 200 uh, hours to uh, minutes? I've just multiplied by 60 minutes makes an hour. For uniformity, because you have to align up whatever is given as per the requirement, the units. Uh, here you can see per unit of P we required 150 minutes, but now the amount given here was in hours. So I've done the conversion of those uh, hours into uh, into minutes. Also, <clears throat> the quantity of Q we were told, it's restricted to 75 units. So again, we cannot go beyond uh, that. Important again to remember that you have to highlight all the uh, constraints which are defining a particular uh, objective uh, in the business or in this particular uh, example. Now, <clears throat> The units of product P, the units of product Q, the P and the Q units can never be zero, uh, or rather negative, sorry. They can be zero, anything else, but not a negative value because we don't produce a negative output at any uh, point. So then our negativity condition is very, very important. Again, when you're setting up here, uh, your problem. When drawing on a graph, we are going to again assume the inquiry is given are uh, like equations. So in the normal way, you have to come up with the values to plot on the Y, again, it's those values to be plotted on uh, the X. We have got uh, uh, three uh, lines to be drawn. One is on the Q is equivalent to 75 from the constraint that we had said, Q units cannot go beyond the 75 units are uh, defined. Then the other two uh, equations, and again, here, as I said from the other previous example, <clears throat> you only need two points. Two points are enough for you to draw the line. And you can assume a point of zero P, you find what is Q, a point of zero Q, what is P, you are good to go to find uh, that particular uh, straight line uh, drawn. The problem was on maximization. So once we have drawn our inquiries on the graph now, assuming straight lines, I've tried, I've 
have tried to, to look at this in form of uh, an equation drawn from one point to another and I've discarded what I don't want. My feasible region here, maybe I should have indicated this. This is what we call the feasible region. In my case, I have not shaded it. And it is the, the region that I'm going to use, the feasible region, is the region I'll use to find my optimal value for uh, the problem. So again, I've used the method of what we call the corner point method, just reading through the coordinates at the corners of my uh, shape here. Again, we can't tell exactly which shape is this. It doesn't look like a trapezium or, uh, yeah. So we find the coordinates at points A, B, C, D, and E, and you have to make sure you have picked all of them. Sometimes there are even so many be careful that you don't miss because you might miss the one that is actually the optimal uh, point. After the substitution, uh, you now come and uh, compare among the various points which has the highest value and such a higher value or the highest among the various that you have computed gives you the solution to uh, the problem. Again, you may not be able to tell exactly if you don't have the graph paper, like at point C or even at point D, where exactly are my coordinates. If you are not clear, just work out with the uh, equations which are intersecting and you find the coordinates X and Y, which you now come back and substitute in there, uh, in the function, uh, and you now be able to have a value which you can compare with the list. Uh, after I did my variation of the points A, B, C, D, and E, I was able to find that at point number uh, at point number D, with the uh, coordinates, uh, the p value being 60, that of the uh, q being 50 from the y-axis. After we substitute this on the equation Z, which is our objective, remember the highest value was coming to 11,440 who'd been shelling as provided in there in the problem. And now we have found what we call the optimal, the optimal uh, point, which we can say this gives us the solution to the, to the problem with the highest value of Z being this, the 11,440 and the values of the P, the units of product P being nine, uh, being uh, 60, and the units of product Q being uh, 50, uh, 50 uh, units. And again, we can also ask ourselves, which were the binding constraints? Let's go back to this particular graphical representation of ours. Point D is at the point of intersection of the two constraints. Uh, that is with the equation 150p plus 90q is equals to 13,500 uh, or from the inquiry to less than or equals to 13,500. And the other one was uh, 100p plus 120q with less than or equivalent to uh, 12,000. If you are to come back and substitute your values of the p and the q so found at the optimal point in the two equations, you realize that we have already exhausted those amount. There's no balance at all at all. The total amount available will have been uh, fully uh, utilized and you realize that the slack value will actually be a zero. But there is this uh, non-binding constraint in our diagram, you can see it. The equation Q is equals to 75. So if you have to come back and substitute uh, the value, yeah, the value of the Q, Q is coming to, at point D, Q was coming to 50, then we have not exhausted, there's a balance of uh, 15. And so we can call it a slack value of 15, which actually is not, uh, uh, is not fully uh, exhausted at the production of the Q. So Q 
you still have a chance to go by and maybe produce those uh, extra unit of uh, 15 uh, units. So when you're doing the sensitivity analysis, uh, uh, that is what I was calling early on, the what if question. What if I were to do this, yeah? What if I were to increase this? You can actually ask us, uh, maybe yourself, what is this resource that we have exhausted? What if we had an additional uh, unit? Like what I've asked myself here, suppose we increase the amount of uh, time in department A by just one, one minute. Then it would mean that one extra uh, minute would cost us how much? And the shadow price worked out is coming to uh, uh, 44 cents or 0 0.44 uh, shilling. What I've done is I've held the amount of time in department B constant, which is still 12,000 uh, minutes. For that of department A, I've actually increased it by just one minute and I've worked for the values of the P and Q. Substituting them in my equation Z, I find the new value of Z. Then I subtract the old value which gives me the shadow price per a minute in department B. The same you can do with, uh, in department A, sorry. The same you can do to department B. You can assume there is an increase of just one minute in department B. And uh, for department A, you hold it constant. Then again, you find new values of the Q and the P. You substitute them in the equation Z and then you subtract from the original value of the Z, that difference gives you the extra amount that you should pay to obtain that one unit of, uh, or the, the one minute for department B, which we actually exhausted. Why it didn't work out on the constraint number three, it's because there's no shadow price. Remember, we had not actually exhausted the whole 75 units we still have a balance of uh, as been able to produce an extra amount, which is now the 15 units, which have not actually uh, been able to produce at the optimal uh, point. So basically what I did with my two illustrations, the previous one and this one, was just to give you a guidance on how, first of all, do I know how to formulate the LP probe? Because in many scenarios you find you're not given this problem, you're the one to formulate it, and then you are able to, uh, for example, uh, solve the problem. Until you have the problem, you cannot now define how to go about solving uh, the problem. So that is what I wanted us to look at. And basically we have looked at the graphical representation. Uh, I'll send you another meeting very soon, probably Monday, we go through the, uh, the simplex method, which is the method two that one can still use in finding a solution to a linear programming uh, method. So I want to unmute you so that you can ask some questions as we... As we wind up our today's session Class, you are unmuted, you can ask something in regard to today's presentation. And again, why I decided to complex this into some workings is uh, this a computation with my explanations, it takes a lot of time to uh, do this, so it may not be enough within the time you are given to be able to do it uh, as I discussed. That's why I preferred to have it done earlier and then I just do the presentation. So anything that you'd wish to ask? You are unmuted. Most of you are unmuted. You can ask a question before we wind up our today's session. Dolkas. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm very okay. And the last? Okay. Okay, when would you like us to look at the simplex method? 
And um, I'm hoping that at the end of today's session, before maybe you sleep, you take that example, you go through it again, you see if you are able to understand it. If you are to be given a, an LP problem, your own, can you be able to formulate it? Because that is the starting point of everything. So anyone else with, a, with an issue? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. the, in, the, in the graphical example, mm -hmm. uh, with the x, there's the x-axis and there's the y-axis. Mm -hmm. So the P, mm -hmm. you have written on the x-axis, where the x-axis is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in, the, in the, the equation you've written 100p plus 90q, mm -hmm. Is equal to 13,500, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. 150p is mm -hmm. in the Q axis. You have interchanged. No, 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 no. Ah. If you have to look at the graphical representation, yes. you realize that uh, you have to identify where you put your equation, or rather, the, the variables. I'd say let the P be represented on the X, let the Q be represented on the Y. And at the end of the day, you have to mark the equations. Every time you draw, you have to mark the equation. Sasa. Okay. Yeah. Ah. So the first thing you do, once you have identified the inquiries, you have to state which one you are representing on the X axis, which you are representing on the Y. My P was represented throughout on the X, the Q was represented on the Y. Okay. Okay. So the okay. marking of, of this, if you are to see on the screen, yeah, this is not the X, this is not the Y, it's the equation that I've marked. The first one, the inner one, which is 150 there, and the other one. And this is not a minus, it's just an illustration of the equation, the line itself, which has to be marked. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So I'll send you another meeting. Monday, is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Probably because uh, you refused the seven o'clock class. I don't know why. I like doing my classes in the morning because I have babies in the house. Before they wake up, I'll have done the class. So is it okay we do at seven? Monday? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, yes. no, no, no. No. Will you still be asleep anyway? Baby's okay. Where are you going at, at seven? And the, and the beauty of us teaching in this manner, you can still have the class when you're still in the bed. You only need to listen to what I'm saying. Can I set a class at seven? No, okay. five is best. Okay, think about it and then you let me know through your WhatsApp group, yeah? And today oh, okay. I also sent you a very big document, one whole computation done in two methods, explaining about how we can go uh, uh, through interpretation of a solution already provided. In some instances, some computers used to generate a solution. So if given a solution itself, would you be able to do the interpretation? Try to go through that illustration. It was uh, 2017 you see if you can understand something out of it. Also, I sent you something on uh, transportation. Uh, and yesterday I did some computations on assignment. Was it yesterday or the day before? I think yesterday. And you can see the way I've done my illustrations, I've tried to explain uh, why I point it like this. Just try to go, it, uh, to go through it slowly, you'll understand. I think quite a number of the details that I've put there. For your exam, you don't have to write everything that I've illustrated there, but the language itself on what I'm doing from step one to two is very, very important. Because now you're far away from me, I need to guide you why I have put point number two like this, 
for number three, like just try to follow that language. Just try to simplify it in a manner that somebody can be able to understand it better. So if you are okay, we stop our class there. Maybe until we have our next session. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Those who are still asleep. <laughs> and at this hour. And we were wondering with the other lecturers. You people, you 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 don't say anything whether you are okay. Are you good to go for the exams? Or you don't know yourselves? Okay, good night. <laughs>